Well, good evening and welcome to the second of our Ian Ramsey Centre seminars for Michaelmas Term 2013. The title of the seminar this evening is Science and Religion in Latin America. And for our speaker this evening, it's a great pleasure to welcome um, my colleague and friend, Dr. Ignacio Silva, who is an Argentine scholar. He's a research fellow at Harris Manchester College and also the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion. And he's a member of the Faculty of Theology and Religion here at Oxford. Dr. Silva studied philosophy at the Catholic University of Argentina and gained his doctorate in science and religion here at Oxford. A major focus of his research is the relations between contemporary physics and various models of divine action in the world. The project he's going to be talking about this evening, uh, Science and Religion in Latin America, really began um, with a cup of coffee about um, three, year, three years ago. And he was just finishing his um, doc doctorate. Uh, it was John Hedley Brook who, and, and Peter, ha Peter Harrison. Um, and we weren't quite sure how to, how to use his knowledge to develop the next stage. And he's got, of course, enormous uh, experience of Latin America. So more or less created this project, Science and Religion in Latin America, because we just don't know what's happening in this part of the world very, very, very much. At least in Anglo-Saxon countries, um, our experience, our knowledge of science and religion, very much shaped by um, Anglo-Saxon concerns, uh, agendas, and so on. So we really just need to know a lot more about what's happening in this ex extraordinarily important region of the world. And thanks to funding from the John Templeton Foundation, we've been able to, um, to run this project, which is just approaching its completion um, at the end of this year. So it's a great pleasure that um, uh, Dr. Silver uh, is going to give us a, a summary of the work that's been done the last three years, and perhaps also suggest some of the ways in which we might um, make progress in future. Would you please welcome Dr. Ignacio Silva. Well, thank you, Andrew, very much. Um, so as Andrew said, we began this whole path with just a cup of coffee uh, somewhere in Oxford, and, and here we are three years after. Um, good. So the talk today is hi uh, highlights us in the is structure in these uh, very simple um, ideas. I'm going to show you a video on what the whole thing is about. We're going to see what's the main structure of a higher education in Latin America that's shaped the whole research and teaching around. Uh, not only science and religion, but every other topic of research and teaching. I'm going to tell you a little bit what the project consisted on and what we found, what are the challenges and some of the conclusions. So first, I would like to show you, if I can, this. Uh -huh. I'll move away. Science and Religion in Latin America is a three-year project from the Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion at the University of Oxford. The goal of these three years of the project were to understand and document the present condition of science and religion in Latin America to promote research and education in the fields, and to help break down the current isolation of scholars in the region. Project activities included three international conferences. The first one held in Mexico City in October 2011, the second one in Brazil in 2012, and the last one in Oxford in 2013. The project also included the translations into Spanish and Portuguese of key works, essay competitions for junior and senior scholars, and a range of new publications. Since the very beginning, we quickly realized the region's great potential for new academic work on the subject. Research groups located in different countries and cities around Latin America joined the project, which grew to a network of over 1,000 scholars throughout the continent. From Mexico to Chile and Argentina, going through places like Guatemala, Colombia, Venezuela, Cuba, and Brazil, scholars traveled to meet both in Mexico City in 2011 and in Rio de Janeiro in 2013. The most striking result that emerged from our research, consulting a wide range of academics in Latin America, was that a very large majority considered that what is presently done in science and religion, in research and in education, falls far short of what should be done. 
Furthermore, a large group expressed interest in carrying out research and teaching themselves or would support work by others in their institutions. Latin American academics expressed interest in a broad range of topics in science and religion, with notable emphasis given to philosophical issues on science and religion, theology and the biological sciences, theology, neurosciences and cognitive science, and the physical sciences and their relation to theology. This response implies considerable untapped potential in the region. We hope that, by the end of this project, a proto-Latin American network of science and religion emerges in order to address current challenges. This network, we believe, should have a truly regional remit capable of covering the range of cultures, institutions, research topics, and resources of interest, acting as a single point of contact and information exchange. Science and religion in Latin America is a journey which is beginning and in which academics from all parts of this vast region will contribute, and from which they will benefit greatly. In years to come, Latin America will certainly bring new and innovative arguments to global questions, becoming a vibrant voice in science and religion current debates. Okay, so now you have a little bit of a, an idea what we did and for, and for how long. Um, so let's focus first on the shape of uh, higher education um, in Latin America. So it's growing rapidly, especially in Brazil, uh, but as well Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru are investing lots and lots of money. In, the, um, in higher education because they're realizing that higher education is the basis for a good society. Brazil has a 300% increase in student enrollment in the first decade of uh, the 2000s. That's a massive amount um, of students. Um, and it, it's something like 150% of PhDs enrollments in, in the growth. It's just incredible numbers. Um, Mexico, Brazil, and Chile have, uh, in, have invested huge amounts of money in sending the best graduate students to the US and uh, Europe to study with, uh, within the best houses um, and with the best professors and to bring them back. Yeah, and that's where we are hoping uh, to aim. So the university sector is divided in three major groups. And uh, in terms of science and religion, this is where um, the whole thing is shaped. We have very large state universities, including two huge ones, UNAM, which is the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, in Mexico, uh, and UBA, Universidad de Buenos Aires, both national universities. They have over 300,000 students each. Um, that's, that was when we began the project. I've asked again um, a couple of weeks ago, and they told me that UNAM is around five, uh, 500,000 uh, now. Um, so that just tells you that the amount of numbers. Um, it, it's just massive. I'm going to show you some pictures about it. Then we have a second large group, which is Catholic universities. Catholic universities are uh, traditional uh, Mostly, uh, not mostly, but many of them are pontifical, pontifical universities um, run by uh, the dioceses of the places. The most important ones are the Pontifical University, so it's Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, the Rio de Janeiro, the Sao Paulo, and Universidad Católica Argentina. Uh, PUC Chile is the second best university in the whole of Latin America. Not only within the Catholic universities in general. Um, and then we have a third group, which is quite heterogeneous. It is relatively new. It's private, smaller institutions based on American uh, universities. Um, these are around 5,000 to 10,000 students. 
And uh, some of them have achieved quite high rankings uh, within Latin America and within their own countries. Uh, Australia and Argentina is one of them. Uh, small university, but very serious, very, very dedicated to research. The vast majority of these universities is usually dedicated only to teaching, not so much to research, right? So we don't find much going on in these universities. Now, the divide between state universities and Catholic universities in Latin America um, usually divides worldviews. State universities are secular, sometimes anti-clerical, so many times anti-religious, most of the times politicized. Uh, UBA, uh, so the Argentine uh, university, state, the largest state university in Argentina, um, is the seed for future politicians. So the political career they make at the university shapes their political careers later on, right? In um, city level or province level or national level. Catholic universities, certainly, they have a Catholic worldview. So it's a religious worldview. Um, not all of them, but most of their philosoph uh, philosophical background and theological background comes from uh, Thomas Aquinas' philosophy and theology. And certainly, there are two communities in each country uh, which talk to each other very little, right? So there are like two major paths in university lives in each country that don't talk to each other much. Yeah? And that's a problem that we try to uh, jump. So a few pictures, right? Uh, here you have um, the National University of Mexico. This is called University City, right? Because it's a little city where they even have a stadium, a football stadium up there. I don't know if you can see it. Um, they have like the second or third best team uh, in Mexico, perhaps the f best team for those watching in Mexico. Um, and then this is their library. It's a work of art on its own. Uh, it's four huge murals um, portraying the history of Mexico. And it's done um, in little stones, one next to the other. Right? The other one are the three major uh, buildings of the Universidad de Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, the first one is the medicine faculty. The second one, two buildings are architecture and uh, sciences, and then law. Then some of the Catholic universities that I was talking to you, clearly this is in Brazil, you can tell. Uh, and the other one is in Sao Paulo, as well in Brazil, Chile and Argentina. And then several of the small universities. The private universities, some of them are also confessional, right? But they are smaller in, in size. Yeah, Methodist, Presbyterian, Evangelicals. Um, Good. So what did we do? Well, as the video portrayed, uh, the project was funded by JTF, started in uh, 2011, it finishes this December, and the idea was to understand the situation, what is going on in Latin America on science and religion, to stimulate new research, and to promote international collaboration. One of the main problems in Latin America, and we'll see a little bit later on, is that it's a little island outside of the map, right? Everybody in the world sees dialogue in the north of uh, the Atlantic and to Asia, and sometimes, oops, sometimes down in Africa. But what's going on in Latin America, very little people know. Yeah? Very few people know. So the idea is to promote this international collaboration, not only within the region, but as well outside of the region. Good, major highlights. We did a big uh, survey. I'm gonna uh, talk you through it. We produced a capability report from that survey. We did some international conferences in Mexico City and Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we got around 300 participants in each of them, which is a massive uh, thing for an academic uh, conference in Latin America, and we finished with an Oxford workshop where we brought 50 key leaders 
um, from Latin America and Europe and the States to meet and to find things in common, right? And most of the pictures in that video came from that, uh, from that meeting. Uh, many new little projects came from that meeting and we are, we're seeing what was going on. As well, we did essay competitions for junior scholars, from senior scholars, we translated the Cambridge Companion for Science and Religion, edited not too long ago, into Spanish and Portuguese. Um, new books came in Colombia, we're editing one here on Latin American perspectives on science and religion. And some new little projects came here and there um, in the region. Good. Uh, so a few pictures. This was our conference in Mexico. We had uh, Professor Antonio Lascano, who's one of the experts on the origins of life. He was very happy to come along uh, with us. This is what happened in Brazil. Uh, we chose this picture because it shows you all the sponsors that were interested in um, being involved. It was not just the University of Oxford, the M. Ramsey Center, and the Templeton Foundation, and Puc Rio. It was all these uh, Brazilian sponsors that were very, very keen in joining the conversation. And that's the image uh, from the workshop at Harris Manchester College. Not only conferences, as well, Andrew, Peter Harrison, Ronald Numbers, Bill Carroll, myself, and many others got invited to give special lectures. So taking the opportunities that we were around, um, everybody invited people to participate in different activities in different um, locations in different universities. So what does this show? Well, with Andrew, we realized right from the beginning when we started getting these invitations that the topic is hot in the region. People are very, very keen, very, very interested in looking at these things and in looking at them, at them academically, yeah? in having a proper discussion, debate, an academic dialogue on these things. Good. Um, some other things uh, that we found. Besides the, free, the three big countries, Argentina, Brazil and Mexico, that we were uh, expecting, we found lots of interest in Colombia and as well in Chile. Um, in Colombia is very interesting. The meeting in Chile, uh, in uh, Mexico, I'm sorry, brought some Colombians, six of them in particular. They didn't know each other. They were all working on science and religion in three different universities in two or three different cities. They didn't know that there were so many people working on these topics uh, only in Colombia and not so far away from each other. So from that meeting in Mexico, they decided to publish a book, and that's the book that came out. Um, I have it somewhere around. There's a new um, project, JTF, funded at Universidad Austral in Argentina on determinism and indeterminism. The Faraday Institute uh, gave some courses in Guatemala and Mexico for the first time in Latin America, and now are looking into Brazil and Argentina for the following years. And the International Society for Science and Religion gave some library awards in the region as well and are looking into doing some more stuff. So through this project, we managed to, to get somewhat the attention of the international scholarly community um, on science and religion. So let me talk you through some findings. Um, as I told you, we did a survey on what's going on and what people want to know in Latin America. So we aimed at academics, yes? We did not aim at the broader public, the general audience. We sent this survey to the research groups in around 300 universities in Latin America. And we were very explicit that it was self-selective and for academics only. Yeah? And by academics, we define it broadly. We define it as anybody who's working within academia. It could have been a student, 
It could have been some, a professor. It could have been a lawyer who teaches at a university at the same time. But we wanted people related to academia somewhat. Um, we got responses from Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, as I said, and many other uh, countries in smaller proportions. It's very interesting that around half the respondents uh, had postgraduate degrees. Uh, that you see licenciado is a licensed degree, which is usually a five-year degree, and a profes professor is not the title professor that we have here. Uh, it's around, as well, a four- or five-year degree, and is the first degree that you get in university. Uh, so it's your first undergraduate degree. Licenciado is a, something similar to a, an MA. And then other degrees, such as engineers, lawyers, medics, and so forth. Um, as well, we had around 50% from the humanities responses and 50% from the sciences. And around 50% came from the top 20 universities in the region. So we thought this is a very uh, representative uh, sample. Again, it was a self-selective um, survey. So only if you wanted, you uh, responded. And it was online. So some of the results might show um, a bit surprising. So 95% or so, or so uh, more or less, of respondents in the second um, part of the graph seem to say that research into science and religion is very important or important. Does this mean that 95% of academics in Latin America think this? Well, clearly not, yes? What it means is that we have at least around 300 people in Latin America interested in doing research, uh, academic research, into these topics. Yes, and that is a very, very big group of people. This, this survey we did in 2011, so it was during the first year of our project. Since then, we found by far more. Now we have around 1,000 people in our mailing lists. Um, same results come from the question on education, so how important is education and how important education should be in science and religion in higher education institutions. And again, around 95% of the uh, respondents said, well, it should be very important or important. Well, it's of their respondents, yes, and I like to highlight that. Still, that is not uh, something that, that we should neglect, on the contrary, um, and is not being done as much as it should be done. Good. So, what are the topics and the resources that people uh, told us they have? So, they expressed a lot of interest in a wide spectrum of topics. Um, there's nothing that we can tell is a Latin American topic on science and religion. Many people over the course of these three years were like, so, so what is that Latin American thing on science and religion? And I'm like, well, you know, Cosmology, evolution, oh, but that's the same as here. Well, yeah, yes, it's similar to here. I mean, they have a strong interest in the topic of life. Um, so what is life? There's many people working on the topic of life. Um, but still, it's not an alien topic to us here or to discussions in uh, the States. So it's not something completely alien in terms of the topics. There's some uh, research going on in psychology, sociology, neuroscience, um, spirituality and health. There's much going on in Brazil. There was a lot of enthusiasm for more resources, for getting resources. They don't have resources, and that's something that I'm going to show you. Um, so basically, these are more or less the numbers from each country uh, on different topics. So, the largest uh, groups were interested in philosophical issues in science and religion, but as well in the life sciences, and by that we mean biology understood in large. Um, neuroscience and uh, religion was something very, uh, very much people wanted to look at. Uh, physical sciences, and that I include uh, physics, quantum physics, cosmology, and so on, historical topics, and so forth. And this is 
how much uh, resources they have for doing research, for teaching in their particular topics and in science and religion. Um, and you can see in the second line how many resources have you got to teach your discipline or have you got enough resources and more than half, around half, um, they said, well, we have quite a lot. It's enough to teach what we teach, but it's not enough in the first line to do research on what we want to do research. And what about in science and religion, the last, these two? Well, there's certainly not enough, and we'd like to get by far more of what we have. So again, what this shows is basically that academia, academia is ready to engage into these topics. Um, there's the interest, there's the human resource to get involved. Um, they just lack the actual resources, material resources. Good, some regional initiatives uh, that are going on in Latin America. The, we knew of three important groups working in Brazil, in Mexico, and in Argentina, and then we found out that there were many, many more. Um, and uh, we believe that, as in any other places, the idea is not just to build a new discipline called science and religion, but on the contrary, to build on the different disciplines which are around in philosophy, in history, in the sciences, and get the dialogue with theological and religious uh, topics going on. Now, we also wondered what are the popular attitudes? So the general public, what are their attitudes towards science and religion? Many people had done some research on this, so we didn't repeat the research. We um, relied on the project Darwin Now from the British Council and uh, a survey done by Datafolia in Brazil, which is a very important um, institutions. Basically, what uh, these two researchers uh, found is that people stand more in a sort of noma, non-overlapping magisteria uh, position. So what Ian Barber would call independence position. And that was the vast majority. There's some, certainly, uh, who proclaim a conflict thesis and those are who sp uh, speak the loudest, perhaps, uh, but it's not uh, the vast majority of people. So we wondered why, because nobody gave us a reason why, and we think there are at least two, um, two reasons why people would stand in this Noma situation, Noma position. First of all, the Catholic tradition, yeah, and the teachings of a metaphoric or spiritual reading of scripture, but as well of God as the primary cause, not the first cause in time, but the primary cause uh, at each instant of things, not mixing with secondary causes, with natural causation, right? Um, and that is very ingrained within the Catholic traditions, uh, and that passes to the people through preaching. Um, and as well, Another uh, idea that we thought was um, continental philosophies. Most of it French and German, right? So phenomenological approaches to religion. Instead of putting it in conflict to the truth of science, religion is seen as a subject of study, an object of study. I study religion as such, yeah? And I don't take its statements as truth claims, right? So Latin America traditionally doesn't have the analytic English tradition of philosophy, yes? Therefore, in the academic environment, they did not clash the uh, traditional theology and science. Now certainly there were many, many battles around, um, but as you might know, Latin America is a huge uh, continent. So one thing is to speak about Argentina, and one thing is to speak about Mexico. 
Uh, in Mexico, the conflict thesis is very engraved. Uh, many, many people, uh, particularly academics, buy into it. Um, we had some experience of that. We were planning our first conference in one university, State University, which couldn't happen because a group of um, scientists claimed that it was not the place to have an academic discussion on science and religion, their university. Um, so the university, for that and other claims, decided that they couldn't host um, the conference, so we had to move to another place, the Universidad Panamericana, as well in Mexico City, which happened to be a fantastic place, and the team which organized it worked very, very well, so it was a really, really good conference. Um, but why Mexico has this, and for example, Argentina wouldn't care much about it? Yeah? Well, historically, in Mexico, the debate, for example, between the reception so the debate about the reception of Darwinism in the 19th century happened in the media, in newspapers, in magazines. It did not happen in academia. Right? That tradition continues today. Yeah? We discuss these things publicly and out loud and without much rigor. In Argentina, the discussion happened in academia. And they were like, well, one thing goes that way, the other thing goes that way. Let's just keep them separate, right? Um, there are certain instances. For example, two years ago, late uh, 2011, a professor in a university, national university in Argentina, claimed that intelligent design should be discussed in biological uh, degrees. And somebody went quick and said, well, no, 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 no. This happened in the media, in the most important newspaper in Argentina, right? But when it, it never reaches the academic actual discussion, right? Because things just happen separately. Um, good. Now, it is also true that nowadays more conservative religious groups are growing. Um, are holding some um, creationist and intelligent design positions, particularly in Brazil, in Bolivia, in Peru, in Chile, in Mexico, a little bit less, but yes, in Argentina. Um, but again, because of the higher education structure, they, these discussions, these groups, tend not to get to the academic discussion, yes? Certainly these are not um, discussions which happen within the Catholic tradition, at least the mainstream Catholic tradition. And they do not happen within um, secular universities. So where do they happen? Well, they happen in small, private, uh, evangelical universities, yes? That do not have much impact within the academic discussions um, where they are. Okay, so Latin America has some special challenges. And the first of them is insularity. So this is an image uh, that Stanford University and Cornell University, Yahoo, and some people in Qatar, they analyzed around 10 million emails going around the world and just to figure out who talks to who, right? Latin America is the pink bit over there. And the little one in the bottom, that's Brazil, which is one of the largest economies in the world, right? They talk to themselves and to somebody else. I, I cannot really follow uh, the line over there. So as I was saying before, Latin America is isolated. Yeah? And you can see that from just this uh, example. So, that's a big challenge to overcome. Some other challenges in general uh, in academia are the following. Well, first, as I said, the fact that they focus on teaching and not so much on research. Very few universities in Latin America focus on research. Um, so there's little time or capacity uh, to do the actual 
research. The very few scientists. Most people decide to study social sciences or uh, the humanities. So the dialogue with the natural sciences uh, gets complicated because there are not so many. And among those not many, the very, very few who are actually willing and perhaps capable of talking with uh, people in the humanities. So again, the, the pool of people with which one can dialogue is not, not large enough. Then those who do research in the natural sciences have their research priorities. Uh, and usually are genetics and agriculture um, and other research priorities which have a direct connection with their economies, right? Um, Argentina is huge in GM crops, and it's a huge discussion about GM crops. Uh, but why? Well, Argentina is a large, large, large producer of crops, right? Crops producers. So, um, that's why that debate goes on there. And then access to new research is often constrained by journal costs and, and different other things, um, which we better don't get into. Okay, so some conclusions. So there is, although there is some opposition to working on science and religion, in particular in the state universities, it is usually a proxy for other issues. Read political and historical issues, right? What was the problem with these people um, in Mexico? Well, they just didn't want the church to get into their university. <coughs> Did it have anything to do with science and religion? Well, actually not. They just didn't want the institution church to get into the national university. Because in Mexico, the history teaches us church had a lot of power, there were many, many wars, long wars, uh, about who would rule the country in the 19th century. And that wound is still open. So there's a big, big resentment between uh, church people and non-church people, put it that way. On the other hand, um, sometimes it's not knowing, lack of knowledge. I just came back from a conference in Chile. It was a full room of physicists and uh, biologists and chemists. And I was like the philosopher, right? And the philosopher who knew about science and religion and who was going to preach to us. And, uh, well, that was a little bit of the idea. We had a round table on science and religion. Very interesting, very, very clever people around. Uh, we all uh, spoke our opinions on the topics. And all the objections that I found, and I had to point this out, were basically ethical objections. Because this person said that, or because this person claimed that other thing. Well, but those are then not problems between science and religion, are problems between religion and morals or ethics. Science is nowhere where you, um, in your debate. And they acknowledged it, and they realized that between science as such and religion as such, at least how we understand it now, yeah, they were more comfortable with an independence position because they couldn't find that bridge where to, uh, to make the, dis uh, the discussions. And, uh, and when I talk them through the things that we usually discuss here in these seminars, um, they were quite interested. And they realized that all the presuppositions, their assumptions, were just that, were assumptions. There is an actual academic discussion going on and that is quite interesting. Um, good, second conclusion is the historical background, which is key to understanding these approaches. Um, as I said, Catholic tradition is big in Latin America, but as well, the whole intelligentsia of the 19th century, so those who fought politically and um, in, in battles, pro proper battles, um, for the independence 
and who design, who structure the countries in Latin America, they were all educated in France, right? Very few in Spain, very few in England. Most of them in France. What happened in France in the 19th century? Positivism, right? Strong positivism, strong enlightenment ideas. Uh, and that is very, very uh, rooted in the Latin America. Still, it's an interesting mix between this strong French positivism and a Catholic tradition, right? And I don't think we have managed to figure it out yet. Another conclusion of uh, these three years is that the region is filled with research uh, groups on science and religion that we didn't know. Um, and, uh, but they do tend to be isolated, and that's why we didn't know about them. Uh, so our job is to bring them together, or try at least. And finally, the international scholarly community on science and religion is starting to look into these developments on science and religion. Um, there are a few examples. Um, the Faraday Institute looking into taking their courses to the region. Uh, the E.M. Ramsey Center uh, thinking of doing more things in the region. The International Society for Science and Religion as well trying to um, engage with scholars of the region. Um, just now, just before I was telling Andrew, before we started, I received an email. You know the journal Saigon, one of the traditional journals on science and religion? It just published two papers uh, from Latin Americans, people that we work with. Um, and I, I, we were very, very surprised. Uh, with that, I was not expecting it. Um, so it's a very nice uh, surprise, very, very, very good thing that these things are happening. So just to finish up, we hope to continue working we hope to continue developing things in the region and uh, we hope to listen to what people in the region have to say because although they have a French, we have, I am from Argentina, we have a French influence and a Catholic influence. Now, for the last 50 years, we also have a big analytic, analytical influence. So Latin America is a little bit like the shaker, and we're still waiting to see what the cocktail is going to taste. Right? Um, so anyway, let's stop there, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you. Checking online, online, online. Uh, okay, well, we have a at least half an hour so for, for questions, and um, I'll just uh, move a happy from the floor to you. If you'd like to wait until mm -hmm. the microphone arrives, then, um, then, we'll, then we'll be able to catch your question as well. Thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned the, the, the importance of the histor historical and yeah. political background in each of the different countries. I notice you didn't really talk very much about a key sort of new wave of political movements in, in well, re-wave um, in, in Venezuela, Cuba, yes. and Bolivia, um, Ecuador, of the sort of socialist yes. countries. And I wonder whether you had people from those countries attending your conferences and yes. whether there was a different outlook from them. Um, unfortunately not. Um, in the conference in Mexico, we had an important historian from Cuba coming and giving a lecture on the reception of Darwinism in Cuba. Um, very, very interesting uh, discussion. But he didn't make much uh, connections with uh, the ruling government over there. Uh, we were going to have some people from Venezuela coming from the National Research Institute in Venezuela. Uh, last minute, they had to drop out. Uh, we didn't really know why, uh, which was unfortunate. We couldn't yet get into uh, the acad academia in Bolivia. We received one or two reply responses to that survey, uh, to which they said things like, here in Bolivia, universities are for teaching. We don't do much research. Um, 
which is something that we want to get in, but, but still couldn't uh, find, find the ways. Um, so yes, unfortunately, we, we couldn't uh, yet get through that. Um, although I wonder what, what would be the, the, yeah, the perspective that they look into these things. So yeah, the question is very pertinent, uh, but I'm sorry I couldn't say much. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I, th I think that Blessed John, John Henry Newman uh, said that the purpose of a university was the dissemination of knowledge, and he used this to argue that um, theology as a body of knowledge should therefore be included in the list of subjects which it teaches. And I just wonder what your opinion of that is, and uh, whether that would mean that uh, um, te te teaching would um, be a, a more, would be a prior sort of um, um, responsibility of the university rather than research. <laughs> so I agree uh, with Newman, certainly. Yeah, I, I, I agree on what a university is supposed to be, a simulation of knowledge, certainly, yes. Um, but I would add, as well, uh, a producer of knowledge. Uh, and that production of knowledge comes through the actual research, uh, not only the teaching. Um, unfortunately, those universities which only focus on teaching tend to teach things which are a bit outmoded. Um, although there are things that, and I agree, do not go outmoded. Yeah? Uh, I'm a Thomist, after all. Um, but, uh, but I think research is a key thing to universities and to the growth of a country. Um, and I think topics on science and religion are crucial uh, to that research. Uh, do everybody need to do research on science and religion? Well, clearly not. Uh, it would be boring. And, and we need people doing research in evolution, evolution and genetics uh, so we can do the research on science and religion, and we need people understanding religions so we can put things together, right? Um, so not every university needs uh, to have a center for science and religion or, or something like that. Uh, I don't believe that. But I do think that this topic is crucial to understanding, um, in particular, Latin America. The Latin American people as a whole even though it's very, very diverse, it's incredibly religious. Um, it's massively religious. Um, so it would be silly not to look at it. Um, and unfortunately, these days, religion is overlooked within the academic, uh, yeah, academic environment in, in the region. So yeah, thank you. Speak a little bit more about um, the gap between the society or the intellectuals and the church. Shall we understand that um, the churches are more or less the intellectual never go to the church? Then there is no dialogue, intellectual dialogue between the society and mm -hmm. the church. And also, is there any correlation between uh, Rome and uh, the heads of the church in uh, South America? Because I'm aware that uh, evolutionism is very trendy in Rome right, right now. So, uh, so the university is very involved in that, and the uh, fathers, Gregory of Nazianzen and his are very popular right now. Mm -hmm. And their, the implication of their theology for uh, evolution. So is there any, right. any dialogue? Judging on your statistics and okay. your graphics, is, I'm not very sure. Okay. Thank you. So, two questions. Um, the first one is whether society has any dialogue or acad the academia has any dialogue with um, uh, churches, right? So, again, we have two main groups of universities in Latin America. One, which is uh, state-run universities, yeah? so national universities or federal universities or provincial yeah, universities, 
which are huge. Uh, most of them are free or very, very um, un inexpensive. Um, for example, at Uba, you could study anywhere in the world can go and study for free whichever degree they wanted, and they will get a very, very good uh, undergraduate degree. Um, something very similar happens at UNAM. Um, I think it's 20 cents a year or something like that. Um, and then you have the second big group, which is the Catholic group yeah, of universities. And those are very important, very influential, and they're very good universities as well. However, the prestige usually is with uh, the national universities, yeah? The top national universities. The top universities in each country are usually national universities. There you go. And as I was saying, these two universities, the types of universities in each country, has its own academic culture and its own academic community, yeah? Now it's changing, but until not too long ago, the Catholic community will not have an academic dialogue with the state community, yeah? state universities community. So in that respect, there was a broken bridge. Over the last, I'll say, 15 to 20 years, that is changing. Yeah? Um, so there are more um, fluent ways to create that dialogue. But it's still a little bit difficult to get into it, yeah? So that with respect to the first question. There are some di uh, debates and dialogues going on. Um, we could only wish there, are, there will be more in the future. And in terms of the second question, which was whether there is an, uh, some connection or something uh, between Rome and um, Latin America, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Pope today comes from Latin America. So certainly, yes. Um, uh, in fact, he asked uh, to pray for missionaries from Latin America to go other places in the world uh, to, to speak about uh, faith in Christ, right? That's the Pope's message. Um, and that's because of the religiosity of Latin American people. So, so there's certain very straightforward connections between Rome um, and Latin America. And yes, evolution is very um, fashionable these days in Rome, that is true. Uh, in fact, the Pontifical Universities in Rome organized the largest uh, conference in 2009 uh, on evolutionism uh, celebrating Darwin. That, that happened in Rome, was a massive event. And uh, I'm not sure how much that in interest from Rome is expressed in other places in Latin America, right? What I expected was a kind of um, um, intellectual connection. Um, okay. Invited at least to the Catholic universities. Oh, I understand. In, in that sense. Um, yes. There are some. Yes, certainly. Um, I can speak at least of examples in Mexico, bringing people from Rome, and in Argentina, certainly bringing people from Rome. I'm not sure how much this happens in Brazil or Colombia, for example. Um, we didn't know. Uh, we didn't find out. So it but, happens the other way, because uh, when we had the Patrice conference here in uh, Oslo uh, two years ago, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people came to the Patrice session, session mm -hmm. and uh, at the end I had a paper, and at the end they gave me the cards and all the names were South American names. But okay. uh, from Santa Croce University, yeah. So I, from Santa Croce? Well, yes. Um, Yes, so the, the work of the Opus Dei within universities is worldwide, uh, in particular in Latin countries. So Santa Croce and Universidad de Navarra have much connections with Universidad Panamericana in Mexico, um, 
Universidad Austral in Argentina and some other universities in Chile and so forth and so forth. Um, so yes, that, that community is a very strong community and we work with them um, and they're very good. Yeah, they do great work. So they are open-minded, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 they work very well, yeah. Um, well, perhaps, okay, my question, maybe I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here. Um, in the West, in the UK and in America, where Protestantism is, is very prevalent, in mean, theory, the Church of England having a Protestant base, we're looking at such doctrines as sola scriptura and so on. And out of this, we get a natural conflict with science, mm -hmm. evolution, you know, being a prime case, but also many other aspects of, mm -hmm. of interpreting the Bible literally. Um, to go to the Catholic faith, as I know to be true for the, for the Orthodox faith, one doesn't have this kind of natural conflict. Mm -hmm. And basically, a centre such as this centre here in Oxford is very valuable in bringing together science and religion, which are naturally kind of pushing each other apart or at conflict, because one can see how one would enrich the other. Mm -hmm. But in Latin America, where we have a prevalent Catholic faith mm -hmm. where Sola Scriptura isn't at the fore, perhaps. There is no such natural conflict. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's much harder, in a way, to bring the two together constructively. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's just... I understand. Point. Perfect. Yeah. Um, many, many good friends from Mexico, Argentina and Brazil, um, they asked me, you know, and they are very involved in this project, huh? And they said, but the, you see... Science and religion is not a problem for us. Mm -hmm. I say, yeah, I know. That's fine. It is not a problem. That doesn't mean that we cannot look at it as a very interesting uh, topic of discussion. Right? Mm -hmm. um, because we can still look and wonder about the universe and, and what scripture has to say about the universe as a whole, or parts of it. Um, and after all, uh, John Paul II wrote an encyclical on faith and reason, and he devoted quite a bit uh, to science. Um, and Gaudium et Spes from the Second Vatican Council as well devoted a few paragraphs to empirical science, more than science in particular, not only reason, right? Empirical science in particular. Um, so if the Second Vatican Council puts it as a topic, it, uh, a pope puts it as important as to bring a, um, a whole encyclical. Cardinal Ratzinger, just before um, being elected Pope Benedict, in his discussion, in his dialogue with uh, Habermas, he said something that shocked many. Uh, he said, well, the doctrine of natural law should be uh, put back on the table and looked at it again with the light of evolution. What do we do with it, right? Um, and there is a document going around. But, so for, for the last 60 years, uh, and not only 60 years, but for the last 60 years, as an example, the Catholic Church has been promoting and have been saying, yeah, come on, let's talk about it. So why not? Um, and I think much can be done uh, yes. from it. Um, but it is true. From a Catholic perspective, and because of that, um, those two things, um, the analogical readings of scripture and um, the doctrine of first course, primary course, and secondary courses, um, there's no problem, there's no clash as such, right? Um, and yes, you're perfectly right there. Now, it is also true that evangelical groups, Protestant groups, which um, argue or advocate for creationist positions um, are growing rapidly in Latin America. So what we thought is, well, let's get there first. You see? If we can tell and convince the academia, both Catholic and secular, that these are valid, serious topics of discussions, and then it, we can engage in it uh, in an academic way, serious debate, 
and uh, people don't have to tear their hairs out you know, <laughs> and fight against each other. It's just an academic debate. Um, then non-academic people would look at academia and say, so wh what do we think of these things, you see? And so in each country, in each region, um, serious academics would say, well, this is this and this is that. And, uh, and we found that this and we found that that. You see? So we, two things. Well, yeah, the Catholic Church doesn't have a problem, but it's quite keen on it. Second, we need to get there first. Mm. It's a strategical yes, type of a very step. Very interesting. So that, that's a different kind of synergy to what we might get. Certainly, there. yeah. And it would be very interesting to do a comparison, I think, as, as, as Elena hinted at earlier with the, with the orthodox traditions, where yes. there is no conflict as such, but nonetheless, there is a very interesting scientific standpoint yep. of the early church teaching there, which exactly, yep. haven't really looked at very much, mm -hmm. needs to be drawn out. So oh, I, um, um, yeah. yeah, sure, something yeah. very interesting can come up mm. uh, of that. Unfortunately, I'm looking at this side of the world. Yeah. Somebody, we need to find somebody to look at that side yeah. of the world. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. impact, I wonder, if any, is there about the science and religion matter in Latin America coming from the debates of liberation theology in the 70s and 80s? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for asking that question. Um, we're actually editing a book, which is coming out in May, hopefully, if we're not late. Um, and we are including a chapter on liberation theology uh, and science. So, the big authors, um, Soberino, Trigo, Gutierrez, and so forth, they all somehow engage with the scientific uh, discourse, narratives. They all, or most of them engage in a sort of, in, how can I put it? From a perspective of harmony, um, concord, yeah, dialogue, if you want. Um, so, segundo uh, Leonardo Boff, for example, um, segundo in particular, he will claim that theology of creation is the natural complement, or even logical complement, of cosmology. Because theology of creation gives the subject, the who, of what cosmology describes. Right? So cosmology describes uh, the appearance of the universe. Well, theology tells us how and who. Right? Um, Boff goes more on the lines of eco-theology, so looking at environmental sciences. Um, and speaking well with the Amazonia there, no, it's very uh, interesting in, in, in those type of discussions. And uh, Trigo gets a bit more into the dialectics of um, the poor and the rich, right? Um, science and technology being associated with the rich, uh, which science and technology, which um, prevent, in a way, the liberation from poverty. Um, so the author, Juan Navarrete, a Chilean uh, scholar who's writing on this, um, wrote something very interesting. Trigo appears to say that he simulates Heidegger's nothing uh, with the poor, so the dialectics between nothing and being in Heidegger are transformed into the dialectics of the poor and the rich uh, in Trigger's mind, right? And the rich being associated with science and technology. Um, so those are the three main stances that I can think of from the top of my head right now on liberation theology. Um, will that answer your question more or less? Some aspects. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'll let you know when the book comes out. <laughs> you can get the chapter. It's probably complex anyway. 
Yeah, 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 certainly. Yeah, uh, yeah if, if I may, um, this is just a very simple, um, even the chapter, it, it's just an introduction to the whole thing. And that's what we asked uh, from the author, uh, just an introduction. It's just a massive topic. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering what research they were actually doing stuff on now. People right. in uh, Latin America. Latin America. Okay. Yeah. So there's some people in Brazil looking at health and spirituality. So which? How can I put this? What results from a spiritual person uh, in terms of his health? or her health, right? Uh, which links are there, if there are any? Um, they're not looking into, I don't know, we have a group of people uh, for whom some people are praying and another group. So they don't do that type of research, right? Uh, they just um, ask people how spiritual they are, how much they pray, and, and how healthy they are. Um, that's a group in Brazil. Um, there's some group in Chile working on the origins of life uh, because apparently Atacama Desert in the north of Chile uh, it's the most similar place we have on Earth to Mars. And so they're researching on the origins of life um, and what theological implications that might have, right? Uh, very, yeah, very quite important researchers over there. And in um, Argentina, there's a group doing um, stuff on neuroscience and consciousness uh, and the notion of the person, and as well on uh, determinism versus and indeterminism in physics and evolution and what implications that has. Yeah. So th those are four or five examples of it. And just just before we finish, I'll just come to the come to the front and advertise our next and final um, talk for this year. So in in in, in two weeks' time, um, I'll be giving uh, a talk uh, suitably themed for Christmas, because at Christmas we um, obviously have uh, often sort of various versions of the Christmas Carol. And uh, the Christmas Carol is all about, all about overcoming the problem of avarice. And avarice is a, is a vice that is um, very mysterious but very important in terms of its influence in, in society. And I'm going to bring together some, some new research uh, in experimental psychology, but also in Thomas Aquinas uh, and Dante, all together in a rich mix, I hope, like a Christmas pudding, um, to look at the problem of avarice and overcoming uh, the problems of avarice as a, as a sort of run-up um, to Christmas. Um, but just on, on that final note, uh, I'd like to invite you to join with me in, in thanking uh, uh, Ignacio Silva for a wonderful talk and for the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you.